Hello, everyone. I'm Maria Milan, the president and CEO of CIRM. Thank you for joining us for this amazing day. This morning, you've heard from researchers, scientists, and patient advocates. They've been called all stars, and they have proven why. Now, I'm so excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, California's first ever Surgeon General. Dr. Burke Harris has revolutionized how we look at healthcare. She is known for linking adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress with harmful effects to health in childhood as well as later on in life. Dr. Burke Harris received her undergraduate degree in integrative biology from UC Berkeley, her medical degree from UC Davis, and after earning her master's degree in public health from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, she went on to a residency at Stanford in pediatrics, and I believe we actually cross each other in the halls and in the ICU during that time. As an insightful and extremely aware physician, Dr. Burke Harris was struck by the emerging research of the impact of early traumatic experiences on present and future health and pursued this to strive for better healthcare approaches for our patients. From 2010 to 2012, Dr. Bar Dr. Burke Harris was at the California Pacific Medical Center, where she also co-founded the Adverse Childhood Experiences Project in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood in San Francisco. And following this, an offshoot was the Center for Youth Wellness, which was created in 2012, to create a model and multidisciplinary approach that focuses on preventing and treating toxic physiologic and neurodevelopmental results of adverse childhood experiences. Her 2014 TED Med talk in San Francisco called How Childhood Trauma Affects Health Across a Lifetime has reached over 7.2 million views. And for those who haven't seen it, I would highly recommend um, watching that TED talk. Dr. Harris released her book, The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity, just recently. On January 2019, Dr. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Dr. Burke Harris as the state's first Surgeon General. She currently serves as a government liaison for the American Academy of Pediatrics National Advisory Board for Screening and sat on the board of, of the Committee on Applying Neurolo Neurobiological and Socio-Behavioral Sciences from Prenatal through Early Childhood Development, a health equity approach for the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Burke Harris is a recipient of multiple awards, including the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism for Humanism in Medicine Award, presented by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Heinz Award for the Human Con Condition. She was named one of 2018's most influential women in business by the San Francisco Business Times. This is just a fraction of Dr. Burke Harris's accomplishments. We are so honored and excited that Dr. Burke Harris can join us for this very special CIRM grantee event. Please join me in a warm welcome to our Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Thank you so much, Maria. That was a very generous um, introduction. And um, I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with you and CIRM grantees today about adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, and more importantly, how we utilize the science to uh, improve health in, in California. So I will um, start by um, just popping up my presentation. So for, for those who are uh, not familiar with adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, I'll start with a brief introduction and then dive into my favorite part, which is the science. So when we're thinking about the purpose for which we apply science, right? It's to improve health, it's to improve health outcomes. And in early 2019, uh, when I was sworn in as California's first Surgeon General, there were three real areas of focus that the governor and I agreed on in terms of uh, areas that where I would do a deep dive to tackle. And those include health equity, early childhood, and this issue of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. And for those who are unfamiliar, or just as a refresher, uh, even for those who are, 
The term adverse childhood experiences really came from a landmark study that was conducted by the CDC and uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, in 1997. And in that study, they asked 17 and a half thousand adults about their history of 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. And these include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was substance dependent, mentally ill, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or intimate partner violence. And what they found in this landmark study were two things that were really game changing. The first was that adverse childhood experiences are incredibly common. So in that study, two thirds of participants had experienced at least one ACE and one in eight folks had experienced four or more. Since then, the state of California has actually started tracking this information in a systematic way as part of our behavioral risk factor surveillance data that we report to the CDC. And statewide, 62% of Californians have experienced at least one ACE and 16% have experienced four or more ACEs. And we see that this prevalence is actually very similar across racial and ethnic groups. We see that looking at national CDC data, we see uh, some slight increases in ACE prevalence among African-Americans, uh, Latinos, and also American Indians and Alaska Natives. But overall, what we take away, right, is that ACEs happen everywhere. They happen with every racial and ethnic group. They happen at every income level. Although we do know that some populations have greater exposure uh, and therefore greater risk. Now, the other thing um, that they found, in addition to the fact that adverse childhood experiences are incredibly common, was that there was a dose response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and negative outcomes. And for, for many of us, right, and for some outcomes, that was kind of intuitive. It was really consistent with what we expect, especially when we think about for mental health. So when we see mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use, impulse control disorders, we see this dose response relationship where the more ACEs an individual is exposed to, the greater their risk of having uh, these negative outcomes. Similarly, we see the same for substance use. We see you know, earlier onset of substance use and, and typically greater severity in a dose response relationship. We actually see on a societal level, the same dose response relationship for homelessness. So this is data actually from Washington state showing, you know, the higher the ACE score, the higher the risk of homelessness. But the thing that was really surprising to many folks was that there was also this same dose response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and some things that many people hadn't expected before. Things like heart disease, cancer, accidents, chronic lower respiratory disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, kidney disease, right? And when we look at the 10 leading causes of death in the United States, having an ACE score of four or more is associated with dramatically increased risk for nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the US. And when we look at the cost to the state of California, right? So last year, um, I and my team published an article that was looking at the cost of ACEs to the state of California from only eight health conditions, right? So it didn't, for example, it didn't include Alzheimer's. It didn't include, uh, uh, you know, kidney disease, right? But just from eight health conditions, the annual cost to the state of California was a $112.5 billion per year. That's over a trillion dollars in 10 years. So we see that adverse childhood experiences not only have a substantial impact in terms of morbidity and mortality, right? But there's also a significant economic impact. But the good news is that ACEs are not destiny, right? And that with early detection and evidence-based intervention, we recognize that we can transform outcomes. 
But in order to be able to do that, it's critical that we understand the biology of adversity. So we all will recall, right, like back in the day when uh, in the early 80s, when patients were coming into the ER and they were having, you know, exceptionally high rates of um, tuberculosis, right? And, and as doctors, we patched them up, we sent them out, and we said, tuberculosis, we know how to treat that. And then they would come back, and this time they would have, you know, a rare pneumonia, pneumocystis pneumonia. And we said, okay, pneumocystis, all right, it's thus common, I got to look it up, but I know how to treat it. And we'd patch them up and send them out. And then they came back with Kaposi sarcoma and other maladies. And the real challenge was that these conditions, while they were health conditions that required treating, really they were symptoms of a deeper problem. And until we treat the root cause, we recognize that our patients were gonna keep coming back and keep coming back and get sicker and sicker. But when we were actually able to target the root cause, the molecular cause of the problem, right, which was not only a virus, but a retrovirus, when we were able to identify antiretrovirals, what we see is that the death rates from HIV AIDS dropped dramatically. And one of the things I love about this slide is that this line up top in blue, that's the death rate for African-American males. This next line in, in red is the death rate for Hispanic males. The orange line is African-American females. And I think for many of us, when we are thinking about doing basic science research, clinical and translational research, right? Many folks don't, uh, that's not the first thing that comes to mind when they think about health equity. But when we truly target the root cause and we are able to improve, dramatically improve outcomes, we see the greatest benefit to the communities that are most severely affected. Uh, and so when we look at um, applying the biology of adversity uh, to understanding how adverse childhood experiences lead to all of these different health outcomes, right? It works a little something like this. So imagine you're walking in a forest and you see this guy, right? What happens in our brains and bodies? Well, immediately our amygdala, right? The brain's fear response sounds the alarm, right? And activates our fight or flight response. So we release a ton of stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol. You know, we have a corticotropic releasing hormone, CRH kicks off the party and we have all these activation of these stress hormones. And so our hearts start to pound, our pupils dilate, our airways open up. And we shunt blood, right, uh, to our large muscles for running and jumping so that we can either fight the spare or run from the bear, right? That's the activation of our fight or flight response. Now, the problem is, if you were to think about it, fighting a bear wouldn't seem like a good idea, would it? No, he's big, he's got teeth, look at him, he's got claws. And that's why the amygdala actually sends projections uh, to the prefrontal cortex, this part of the brain that's responsible for judgment and impulse control and executive function. And it turns it way, way down, right? We see this dramatic down regulation of prefrontal cortical functioning, right? Because if you're in a forest and there's a bear, the last thing that you want is impulse control getting in the way of survival, right? And instead what it does is it turns up the noradrenergic nucleus of the locus ceruleus, or as I like to call it, the part of the brain responsible for, I don't know karate, but I do know curries it right? This is the within the brain stress response center, and it gets us amped up. Now, the, the less commonly known thing when we activate our stress response is that it also activates our immune response. Because if you're getting in a fight with this guy, you want your immune system to be primed to bring inflammation, to stabilize whatever wounds so that you can live long enough to either beat the bear or get away. It's brilliant. 
It was evolved over millennia to save our lives from a mortal threat. But the problem is what happens when this bear comes home every night. And this biological, this physiological response is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health damaging. And children are especially sensitive to this repeated activation of the stress response, right? Because we recognize this period of early childhood development is a time of critical and sensitive periods of neuronal plasticity. And so high doses of adversity during these critical and sensitive periods leads to outsized impact in uh, the development of children's brains and bodies. And so high doses of adversity in childhood is associated with dysregulation of the biological stress response, right? The sympathoadrenomedullary axis and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, our SAM and HPA axes. And what we see is they can become overactive and have difficulty turning themselves off, right? So we lose feedback inhibition of the physiologic stress response. We see overactivation of the amygdala. And in fact, we can see um, structural and functional changes in the amygdala. We see inhibition of the prefrontal cortex, which results in impaired executive functioning. We see toxicity of the hippocampus, right? So high doses of cortisol is uh, neurotoxic uh, to hippocampal uh, neuronal cells. And, and that leads clinically to difficulty with learning and memory. We see changes to the ventral tegmental area of the brain and the reward center, the nucleus accumbens, right? Which is associated with altered reward signaling and increased risk of engaging in risky behaviors. So we saw previously increased risk of substance dependence, uh, et cetera. But immunologically, we also see increased inflammatory mediators and markers of inflammation and inhibition of anti-inflammatory pathways, which lead to increased risk of viral infection, certain bacterial infections, and chronic inflammation. On the hormonal level, we see long-term changes in ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, cortisol, adrenaline, and other hormones that lead to increased stress activation in the body. We see changes in growth hormone, thyroid hormone, pubertal hormones that can lead to changes in growth and development, as well as metabolism and puberty. We see changes in leptin and ghrelin, uh, which are hormones associated with um, appetite and satiety that lead to increased risk of overweight and obesity. And ultimately, when we think about it, right, like if you're exposed to early adversity, we get it. But once you're a grown up, right? Like once you're old enough to leave the house, why do we see these long-term changes in health risks, right? Increased risk of cardiovascular disease, increased risk of stroke. Well, what we see is that changes in the way our DNA is read and expressed, right? Changes in epigenetic regulation, alterations in DNA methylation and histone modification lead to changes in the way our brain and our organ systems subsequently respond to stress. It leads to changes in the way they're wired to respond to stress. And finally, we see uh, erosion of our telomeres, right? Those bumpers on the ends of our DNA that protect our cells from wear and tear leads to premature cell death and altered cell replication, increasing risk of disease. And so we now understand that when we see this early life adversity that is influenced by protective factors as well as predisposed vulnerability, this leads to long-term changes in neuroendocrine immune and genetic regulatory functioning, right? That then has clinical implications in terms of increased risk for endocrine, metabolic, reproductive, and um, lots of different physiologic 
derangements and increased risk of uh, negative health outcomes. And one of the things that was a real question that people asked was, wait a minute. So if you have early adversity, why are there, you know, you're telling me that it's, you know, double the risk of ischemic heart disease, three times the risk of chronic lung disease, two and a half times the risk of stroke. But we now understand that this toxic stress mechanism, the dysregulation of the stress response, right, is this common pathway by which lots of different types of early adversities, whether it's abuse or neglect or having a parent who's mentally ill, right, that leads to a common pathway of dysregulation of the stress response that then uh, when, when um, uh, you know, buffered by protective factors or, uh, or through mechanisms of predisposed vulnerability can lead to a range of physiologic outcomes. And so we see that um, although the original ACE study was done in adults and really looked at adult health outcomes, including those nine out of 10 leading causes of death, which I showed earlier, we recognize that the signs and symptoms of toxic stress are evident as early as infancy, right? So in babies, we see you know, developmental delay, growth delay, failure to thrive, sleep disruption. In school-age kids, we can start to see increased risk of asthma, pneumonia, viral infection, atopic disease, learning and behavior difficulties. And then in adolescence, we see more uh, increased risk of obesity, diabetes, headache, abdominal pain, and then uh, substance use, teen pregnancy, uh, pubertal changes, uh, hyperthyroidism, et cetera. And one of the things that we recognize is that uh, this toxic stress physiology can in fact be handed down from generation to generation through this epigenetic, some of these epigenetic and stress signaling pathways, right? And so mom's own history of ACEs, the adversities that a mom experiences in pre-pregnancy, right, before she's 18, actually affects her risk of perinatal and pregnancy outcomes from preeclampsia to impaired fertility, altered microbiome, uh, affecting pregnancy intention, maternal risk behaviors, maternal chronic diseases like uh, diabetes uh, and obesity, and increases the risk for fetal loss, preterm birth, and low birth weight. So now that we understand the mechanism, we understand the biology, right? The thing that I get so excited about is that we have the opportunity to use the science to break the cycle. So how do we do that? Well, first, one of the things that's critically important is recognizing risk factors for toxic stress, right? That while adverse childhood experiences are risk factors for toxic stress, uh, other risk factors for toxic stress also exist, right? ACEs are not the only risk factors for toxic stress. So things like racism and discrimination also can lead to a dysregulated stress response, poverty. And now we're recognizing that the pandemic is not only increasing ACEs, but it's also reducing the buffering factors that, that can uh, reduce the impact of those ACEs, therefore increasing the risk of developing the toxic stress response. Because when we look at the definition of the toxic stress response, as initially elaborated from the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, and uh, most recently just updated by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we recognize that it happens on a spectrum, right? So the, our stress response is characterized into the positive stress response, the tolerable stress response, and the toxic stress response. And the positive stress response is that normal and healthy response to an immediate stressor. It involves brief activation of the stress response with brief elevations in heart rate, blood pressure, and hormonal levels. But homeostasis, right, the body's biological balance, recovers quickly through our natural coping mechanisms. 
The tolerable stress response is the adaptive response to a more severe or intense, but time limited stressor. And in, with the tolerable stress response, homeostasis can recover through the buffering effect of caring adults and other interventions, right? Uh, but it's when we don't have those buffering effects and when the stressor is not time limited that we see prolonged allostasis, right? The change in the biological baseline that establishes the chronic stress response where we see changes in brain architecture, uh, we see changes in the structure and function of the brain and developing organ systems uh, in a way that increases the risk for morbidity and early mortality. So when we understand that, right, if we dive a little bit more deeply into what is it, what is it about, so I'm just gonna go back for a second, like it's really clear. In fact, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine just issued a whole consensus report about this in 2019, right? About the powerful effect of the buffering caregiving and other interventions to mitigate the toxic stress response. So what is it, right? As we dive a little deeper, because again, when we understand the mechanism, then we have opportunities to deploy this science uh, in service of healing uh, patients who are experiencing a toxic stress response. So one of the things that we know about supportive relationships, right? It works on several different levels. It works on the psychological and developmental uh, levels in terms of uh, safety signals and positive relationships. Um, but it also activates through a series of pathways, including oxytocin release, affecting oxytocin receptor distribution and binding, it affects neural priming in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And also uh, it's believed that there are other possible mediators, including dopamine, serotonin, opioids, epinephrine, and norepinephrine uh, in terms of how these, the social buffering works. And what we do recognize is that uh, social buffering actually has a direct effect in inhibiting the biological stress response through HPA and SAM activation. And so when we look at how this all works together, right, we understand that responsive caregiving and uh, a supportive buffering not only affects our neurological systems and our neurological priming, but it also affects our immune system, our cytokine balance, our inflammatory tone, and the maturation and proliferation of our T cells. And all of this happens, you know, uh, in the biological environment uh, where we have our, our brain development, our immune system, our neuroendocrine um, responses are all developing and adapting either in a context of adversity, trauma, activation, or in a context of buffering and regulation and uh, moving towards uh, homeostasis. And that profoundly affects our risk of uh, subsequent morbidity, mortality, uh, and in addition, social and behavioral outcomes. So when we, Understanding this, right? Understanding this, one of the things that I think is really powerful is the ability to take this science from animal studies, from uh, you know, some of the, the basic science research on understanding how the stress response works, how it affects behavior development and physiologic functioning, and really start looking at, okay, so how does that affect patient care? How do we use this science to improve outcomes for the 62% of Californians who have experienced at least one ACE? And what we see is that this buffering of the physiologic stress response actually is associated with clinical improvement of outcomes, right? So an MRI studies found that institutionalized children who were randomized to high quality nurturant caregiving, right? 
And I'm, I'm not going to talk about how sad it is that kids need to be randomized into high quality nurturing caregiving. But in this, in, in, in this particular study, um, they did MRI, um, uh, brain MRIs of kids at age two when they were randomized and then subsequently at age eight. And what they found was that the children who were previously institutionalized, who were randomized into high quality nurturant caregiving, the developmental trajectory of the white matter structures of their brains at age eight looked like the, the brains of children who were never institutionalized and were significantly differentiated from the kids who were in the care as usual group. So what that indicated was really normalization of the developmental trajectory of those white matter structures. Similarly, we see that interventions like meditation, uh, which uh, helps to regulate the sympathetic and parasympathetic balance, right, the, of the stress response, is associated with decreased interferon gamma, natural killer cell production of interleukin-10, and increased T cell production of IL-4. And that social supports protected against the rise in infection risk associated with the increased frequency of conflict. We see oxytocin, right? That bonding hormone, one of my faves, released during, uh, during childbirth. And I have to say, as a mom with four boys, every time you know one of my boys gets into a scrape or something scary or stressful happens, the first thing that I do is scoop them up and wrap them up into a hug, right? And what am I doing? Well, not just letting them feel safe and empathized with, but I'm also releasing oxytocin in their bodies, right? And we see that oxytocin is associated with inhibiting the stress response, enhancing bonding, protecting against stress-induced cell death, has anti-inflammatory effects. It enhances metabolic homeostasis and protects the vascular endothelium, right? So all of the kind of the opposite of everything that the toxic stress response does oxytocin uh, seems to be an important part of regulating or reestablishing that homeostasis and really has the contradictory effects. Research from McGill University found that nurturant caregiving, again, was also associated with epigenetic changes. So they actually did, you know, a, now a very famous study in rats, and they had rat pups and a little while after the rat pup was born, they'd had a research assistant go in and handle it, handle them and stress them out. And what they found was that some of the rat moms did lots of nurturant caregiving, lots of licking and grooming and nursing, and some rat moms, not so much. And the rat pups that received lots of nurturant caregiving when they uh, you know, got older and they had um, tests of how, how intrepid there were, their stress tolerance, their ability to navigate a maze, so some of their cognitive and executive functioning tests, and they performed better on these tests, right? They actually looked at the feedback inhibition of their biological stress response of their HPA axis and found that their um, HPA axis actually turned itself off, uh, had more normal feedback inhibition, and what they found was that this was strongly associated with the epigenetic markers uh, that were associated with the nurturant care. And then the fascinating thing that they did, and I will say, I think that maybe Michael Meany and his colleagues have been watching too much life, Lifetime television, but they switched those rat pups at birth, right? And what they found was that for the pups that were raised, the pups that were the biological offspring, of rat moms that, that did not do lots of nurturant caregiving, but they were raised by a foster mom who did lots of nurturant caregiving. They performed better on these tests of executive functioning. They had a more normally functioning HPA axis with no, more normal feedback inhibition. And when they looked at their epigenetic regulation, it was the markers of their rearing mothers, not of their biological mothers. So we really, uh, that was a really powerful um, example of how nurturant caregiving can be associated with epigenetic um, changes. And 
so when we look at this this research, this um, uh, in in animal studies, in vitro studies, you know, clinical studies, but when we look then translate that to population-based studies, right? Um, and we look in populations around the, the presence of these buffering factors, right? Uh, uh, what we see is that even for those who have high ACEs, right? The presence of all of the buffering care assets, and they looked at a bunch of them, including having a trusted adult and a number of these buffering caregiving factors that help to reduce the stress response. They also found that it reduced the prevalence of total childhood poor health, including asthma, allergies, headaches, digestive disorders, and school absenteeism from 59.8% to 21.3%. And so as we start to understand how do we go from the molecular, right, the understanding, the disruption to the physiologic stress response, to the physiologic, to the clinical, to the societal, right? I believe we have a powerful ability to translate this science to improve the health of our population. And as California's first Surgeon General, I have set a bold, uh, agenda to cut ACEs and toxic stress in half in a generation. Now, that sounds incredibly ambitious. However, it's, it's not pie in the sky. It's based on things that we've actually been able to do before using a public health framework. So, for example, when we look in the United States between 1996 and 2016, right, 20 years, that's one generation. We cut the prevalence of teen smoking from 25% to 3.6%, and we did that in 20 years. An even better example, here in California, uh, we implemented a unique initiative targeting maternal mortality. And with this initiative, the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, through systematic efforts to determine the sources of maternal mortality and establish protocols to train our providers on how to respond in a uniform and evidence-based way, we reduced maternal mortality in the state of California by 55% while maternal mortality continued to rise, right? This is red line here, continued to rise nationally. We did that between 2006 and 2013. And so when we look at how we, we can cut ACEs and toxic stress in half in a generation, right, it requires us to take an evidence-based approach. And step one is intervening early, taking advantage of the fact that biologically, a number of critical systems are developing and humans have high plasticity during these early life stages. So intervening early was an important recommendation of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine. And so California's approach has been really to take a collaborative approach to primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention includes addressing the systemic and structural factors and raising public awareness. Systematically deploying broad scale screening to enable early detection, right? That's secondary prevention. Detecting earlier so that we can intervene earlier when it's less costly and less and more likely to be effective. Interrupting vertical transmission, that transmission from parent to child by advancing ACE screening, not only in children, but also in adults with a special focus on the prenatal and early parenting years. Coordinating and strengthening our network of referral and treatment systems, right? That's the tertiary prevention. What is our treatment and intervention to make them more effective, accountable, and easy to navigate for children and adults. And finally, which is, I'm gonna say is my, uh, perhaps my favorite part, advancing the science of toxic stress to identify potential therapeutic targets and improve the efficacy of our interventions.
So when we look at how this all fits together into a public health approach, uh, when we look at you know, public awareness, cross-sector training and competency, county and local network of care coordination, trauma-informed clinical care, primary care screening for ACEs, and toxic stress research. Currently, the Office of the Surgeon General is working hard to advance efforts on all of these fronts. But if there's one thing I would say, you know, there's a way in which this pyramid should really be flipped, right? Because we know that all of this work really is, is based on the research. It's based on the rigor and fidelity of the research in order to put in place uh, these interventions. And so California's investment that is really based on the science and this evidence includes almost $150 million over two years to not only train providers on how to screen for adverse childhood experiences, how to recognize the signs and symptoms of toxic stress, and how to respond with trauma-informed care, but also for once, this is not an unfunded mandate. We're actually reimbursing our Medicaid providers for screening for ACEs. So any Medicaid provider who goes through the training, because just like anything else in healthcare, while we want our providers to screen, we wanna make sure that they're appropriately trained on how to screen and how to respond. But in addition, we initiated in partnership with the California Initiative to Advance Precision Medicine, we've issued a $9 million RFP for demonstration product, uh, projects that use a precision medicine approach to address the health impacts of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. And finally, uh, really doing that cross-sector collaboration and coordination across the Newsom administration to make sure that all of our efforts really tie into each other. And so uh, our initiative is called the ACEs Aware Initiative, focused on empowering clinicians and providers uh, with training and tools. We're doing a phased approach, which includes provider training, provider engagement, and then also a learning and quality improvement collaborative so that we can really implement a data-driven iterative evaluation and quality improvement process so that we can disseminate, identify and disseminate best clinical practices. So right now, the way that our initiative is structured and the way that our current screening tools and trainings and response uh, is structured is that you know, we're training providers on how to implement principles of trauma-informed care, how to identify ACE-associated health conditions. And um, on our ACEs Aware website, we have a long list of ACE-associated health conditions, both for adults and for children, which have the odds ratio of these health outcomes for individuals who have four or more ACEs. And then recognize that we recommend the current evidence that we supplement treatment of these ACE-associated health conditions with interventions that specifically target an overactive stress response. And some of those include things like mindfulness, meditation, social supports, uh, mental health interventions. But one of the things that I think is really important, right, is that when we understand the science the opportunity to advance the research so that we can potentially supplement current best practices with supra-physiologic interventions to regulate the stress response, I think is an extremely promising area of research, right? I think many folks have, when we thought about the effect of early adversity and thinking about what our interventions are, we recognized that much of the research that has come into this field has appropriately come from our mental and behavioral colleagues who have been shouting from the rooftops about the, the impact of early adversity on health. But now that we understand the dysregulation of the immune system, 
the overactivity and the dysregulation of the HPA and SAM axes. Now that we understand the role of oxytocin in regulating the stress response, as well as other factors, right? The opportunity to uh, use this science to develop novel therapeutics, I think is really powerful. And particularly considering the fact that we're talking about almost 17% of Californians have four or more adverse childhood experiences to a cost of hundreds of billions of dollars per year just in the state of California alone. And so the opportunity to improve outcomes for patients and also improve health equity and health outcomes, I believe is a very powerful one. And so as we, as we apply the current best practices, you know, validation of strengths and protective factors, referring patients to current best practices, uh, including uh, mental health, social work, so that we can reduce that dose of adversity. We also uh, recognize that we have a lot more science to do in this area. And so we certainly need more researchers across the state, across the country, uh, really looking at how do we exploit these mechanisms, the physiologic mechanisms of repair to improve outcomes for individuals who have experienced adverse childhood experiences or toxic stress. And finally, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine recommends conducting research that measures the impact of chronic stress on all relevant organ systems and determines the specific molecular and biological pathways of interaction, both during the, the prenatal and postnatal, but also developmental, and I would say over the life course, right, that are directly relevant to potential intervention and particularly to address health disparities. Um, so coming up later this fall, the, my office will be releasing the Surgeon General's report on adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. Because I believe that with all hands on deck, as we are you know, harnessing and galvanizing the time and talents of our primary care providers, our community partners, um, but also our, our mental and behavioral health partners, our cross-sector partners, and also our research partners, right? As we're advancing the science, I believe that when it comes to the issue of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress, we have the opportunity to see this dramatic reduction right, over the next uh, two decades in a generation, just as we saw with cigarette use, just as we saw with maternal mortality, just as we saw with HIV AIDS, right? Every single one of us has an important role to play in, in shifting the curve, in improving outcomes and creating breakthrough solutions for our communities and, uh, and for California. Thank you so much, and I will take the opportunity to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke Harris. That was an incredible keynote talk and a tour de force. And we are really very, very fortunate to have you at the helm with your understanding of medicine, science, and behavior and social sciences. It's quite an amazing intersection of all of those interests and skill sets that's going to help drive this. And we're really looking forward to that report in the fall. Um, we have a few questions. Um, some of them were coming in during your talk. And maybe this is another opportunity to, to kind of bring up some things that you already may have addressed, but it'd be great to if, if uh, we could just go through these questions. So the first question is, um, how can we as Californians address the ACEs cycle? Um, and how can the scientists doing the work that they're already doing, whether it be discovery, translation, or clinical stage, already start thinking about how they can, um, you know, uh, craft their, their research plans according to this, taking this into account, even today? Yeah, so um, a big, the funny thing about being the Surgeon General is that a big part of my job 
uh, particularly in leading our efforts around ACEs and toxic stress, is really helping folks to recognize the role that they are already playing and how that can coordinate with the larger efforts, right? So if you are a researcher, be a researcher, right? I was recently, um, so as part in my role, I'm also on uh, the governor's uh, task force on Alzheimer's. And I was recently talking with researchers who are doing um, Alzheimer's research and um, specifically looking at the fact that individuals who have had greater doses of adversity or um, particularly certain communities seem to have poor outcomes when it ha uh, related to Alzheimer's. So within whatever your sphere of research is, understanding to, to the extent that it's you know, consistent with your, with your, your research um, focus, I think one of the questions is interrogating those questions about why is it, what are some of the molecular mechanisms that underlie some of these patterns that we're seeing with um, poorer outcomes for individuals who have experienced greater doses of adversity. And if you're, whether you're looking that, whether you're looking at that in, um, you know, a basic science model or a, you know, an animal model or even looking at cell signaling, what is the role of, you know, high doses of uh, adrenaline and cortisol and CRH in affecting the uh, the cell signaling and the functioning of if you're looking if you're doing, for example, uh, research in immunology or research in uh, proliferation of neurons, whatever it is, you know, it, there's a potential connection to the science of toxic stress. Absolutely, and I encourage um, the uh, attendees to tune in for the panel this, later this afternoon called Knowledge Networks, and perhaps we'll hear a little bit more about how genomics data sets from the Precision Medicine Initiative, as well as the CIRM Initiative and our collaborations could be tapped into for this. And so the idea of making sure that we, um, we coordinate our efforts, do what we do, but do it well and be aware of all these resources where we can make those connections, um, I think is absolutely critical. I love your statement about turning that pyramid upside down, um, where the science should drive the other the other pieces and and making sure that this is evidence based. And um, I think there's so many opportunities for for many of the researchers and and um, stakeholders tuning in uh, today. So that was a very impactful talk. You covered a lot. Thank you so much. Um, I have a second question here. Uh, that says it's more kind of on the practice level, on the you know on the implementation level. Do you see stress evaluation becoming a required part of annual health evaluations, such as blood tests, images, etc., either for healthy um, you know for healthy individuals or even in the course of treatment of their underlying diseases? Um, that's a great question. So I'll tell you what I. Um, uh, envision. So in my, in my previous life, before I became a uh, state surgeon general, uh, one of my roles was as uh, founder and principal investigator of the Bay Area Research Consortium on Toxic Stress and Health. And uh, we did a um, randomized control trial looking at um, uh, ACE screening, and then also looking at biomarkers for toxic stress, right? Because one of the biggest challenges that we have right now is that despite everything that I've just shared with you, we don't have agreed upon clinical diagnostic criteria for toxic stress, right? And so um, right now, the strongest proxy that we have in terms of really having a, a, a very rigorous evidentiary basis is the, the ACE score in terms of cumulative adversity, right? We have very large data sets with hundreds of thousands of folks internationally heterogeneous population that say, okay, if you have four or more ACEs, your relative risk of ischemic heart disease, you know, is, is yeah, 220%. But one of the things that's really important is a question of, that may be true on a population level, but what does it mean for me? If I walk into my doctor's office, and my ACE score is four. How do we, how does my um, clinician interpret my health risks, my, you know, uh, based on my 
my physiology, right? My predisposed vulnerability, and then also whatever protective factors I have. And so really understanding, I think biomarkers for toxic stress is, is really the place is where we're going in the future to say it is fast and easy for us to screen everyone for ACEs, right? But for those who, who do have a high ACE score, right? Then how do we do a deeper dive in understanding their physiology and what their actual health risks are? And also the question is, how is that toxic stress showing up in their bodies? Is it, why is it that some patients have uh, severe behavioral outcomes, mental and behavioral outcomes, and the, and the result is primarily neurodevelopmental, right? Whereas some patients develop autoimmune disease, right? Some people, some patients get Crohn's. Some, some patients uh, have, ha, develop asthma, right? For a child who has four more ACEs, they're twice as likely to have asthma. And so better understanding, is this toxic stress physiology? Is it neurodevelopmental predominant? Is it immunologic predominant? Is it endocrine predominant, right? And better understanding what are the factors that control that? And then what does that mean in terms of our intervention? Right now, all of the tools that we have are very blunt instruments, both for assessing risk and then also for intervention. And what my dream is to see led by the science and based on the rigor of the science, a better understanding of these pathways in a way that advances our ability to uh, diagnose and treat our patients so that we can get to better outcomes. Thank you so much. And that would be incredible if we were able to do that, really truly treat the patients rather than um, using the blunt instruments. We have, um, I think, time for two more questions. Go ahead, Nadine. No, I just want to. I just want to like highlight for folks that recognizing that, you know, I talked a lot about the health outcomes and the nine out of ten leading causes of death, but when we are talking about if we were truly to develop interventions to regulate the physiologic stress response, okay, when we look at our incarcerated population in juvenile incarceration, upwards of ninety percent of those kids have have aces, have at least one ace. 50% with four or more ACEs. When we're looking in the special ed population, right? Like when we're talking about the impacts of developing effective interventions for, the, for a toxic stress physiology, the impacts I think are profound in terms of health outcomes, but in terms of societal outcomes, right? In terms of homelessness, and unemployment and you know, violence and incarceration, I think that there are really far reaching implications. And that's a big part of the reason why this has been such a big focus for me as Surgeon General, because this truly is a public health crisis. And we have an opportunity to advance the science uh, in a way that could have really, really important implications for our, our society's future. Thank you. And then the next question is somewhat um, related to this, um, and I'll just um, read it. I'm fascinated by the relative homogeneity of ACEs across ethnic groups, with the exception of Native Americans. Given what we know about our society, can you comment, can you comment on how this may be? Um, it goes on, is it possible that there are different, differing levels of salience across groups and the socioeconomic status impact? So what the data tells us um, is that um, w when it comes to the traditional ACEs, um, while there are differences, and I do want to emphasize that, uh, for example, uh, racism and discrimination are risk factors not only for ACEs, but also for toxic stress, right? There's one, in which, one way in which they increase the exposures um, so, for example, if there's racial profiling, right, then African Americans, and we see this all the time, more likely to be stopped by police, and then therefore more systematically more likely, uh, African American children then become systematically more likely to have a parent who's incarcerated. So there's a direct level of increasing ACEs, but there's also a direct um, uh, mechanism by increasing the risk of toxic stress 
simply by activating that physiologic stress response, right? And I feel like even I have experienced this as a black woman being Surgeon General doesn't mean that you're immune from that, the, that feeling uh, when you get discriminated against, when someone has, when you have that negative uh, interpersonal reaction, right? And so those, those um, uh, repeated experiences of adversity also directly lead to an increased risk of the toxic stress response. But this is why I think that advancing the science and biomarkers of toxic stress is so important because we know that the original ACEs didn't include discrimination as one of their criteria, right? Um, and so we, while someone may have a specific, uh, you know, a, a specific number of exposures to the traditional ACEs, we know that the impact of adversity is cumulative. And then if you tack on on top of that uh, discrimination, if you tack on on top of that other adversities, then we see an even greater risk of toxic stress. And our ability to measure that, I think, is really important. Um, and that's why you know, looking at biomarkers for toxic stress to better understand how the physiology is playing out and what that means in terms of health risks, I think, is really important. Thank you so much. And then, and we have so many coming in, but we're going to cut it off at this question, um, which is more of a statement, really. So I want to give you a virtual high five for an amazing talk. And the last question is, do you think in these shelter at home times, a virtual hug could result in increased oxytocin levels? Or is it <laughs> like uh, uh, virtual hug contact? Or what can we do to, to release all that oxytocin? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I, I think that is a question for investigation, right, of how, whether there are virtual means to uh, activate that oxytocin pathway, because uh, if there are, they are desperately needed right they now. Are. They are. <laughs> so, and yeah. Dr. Harris, th thank you so much for joining us. This was an incredible session with you. We really, really appreciate you so generously spending your time, all this knowledge, a lot of information, but done so well. Thank you very much. And we're looking forward to having you over again soon, virtually or otherwise. And I'm sure there will be many people contacting you because this is such an interesting topic. And thank you for what you do. Thank you. It's Bye, my everybody. Pleasure.